Good evening and welcome back to Chitkara University's Explore series. Today we have with us a very inspirational personality, a mechanical engineer, an innovator, an academician, a revolutionary, and a man who is so simple and speaks from his heart. Ladies and gentlemen, and our lovely viewers, let's welcome Mr. Pranam Wangchuk to our program, the Explore series. Good evening, sir. How are you doing today? Good evening. Thank you. And uh, hello, everyone, on this uh, session. I greet you from the mountains of Ladakh. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, you are a true Bharati who's been also conferred with the Raman Maxise Award in 2018 for your works and, you know, uplifting the Ladakhi youth and creating life opportunities for them. And uh, also, you know, embracing and motivating them to revive and live up to the Indian culture and, and you know, harness uh, nature. So, sir, uh, my first question is, I won't even say that, you know, uh, it was nice meeting you a few months back, but I would say that we meet you every few hours because you're all on TV and everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, so my question is that, you know, looking at the topic of uh, uh, economics of giving, what we, do, we have decided to, uh, you know, debate and discuss upon. Uh, my question is that uh, generosity, I'm just repeating, is a long-standing human, uh, you know, tradition. And uh, what does it take to, for people to give? Uh, what does, what does what, what, how people are motivated to give? So what exactly uh, are your thoughts on that? Hmm. Um, so, generally, I think that people, uh, as much as they want from uh, others, they are wired, programmed to also give and help. And that's how the human species survived on this planet during this process of evolution. And um, talking of my own experience as a child, I <clears throat> grew up in a very tiny little uh, village in Ladakh. You know, it was a village so small that it had only five households. And I learned things from farming and animals and people and then grew up later to go to uh, do my engineering. And I was doing my engineering fine. Um, Otherwise, Otherwise, as you, you may know, know um, you know, engineers or these undergrad uh, teenagers, uh, they're all about their own ambitions and their own uh, competition and so on. But uh, I would say, luckily, I had some financial issues in my college time. So my father had issues with me on the subjects that I would choose in engineering. I was very, very interested in mechanical engineering. And uh, that's why I had chosen uh, engineering in the first place, because I was very interested in how optics works, light works, therefore solar energy works. And then um, when I asked or told my father I was choosing mechanical engineering, he put his foot down and said, uh, that's not a discipline which has scope in Ladakh and you should look for civil engineering. Because of this difference with my father, um, we had an, uh, an argument at the end of which my father said that um, if you want to still do mechanical engineering, then you will do it with your own expense. Don't expect anything from me. Yeah. And uh, some voice inside me said, thank you very much. And I uh, considered my dreams, my passion for light and optics and mechanical engineering uh, above this difference. And therefore, I chose to do that. But the challenge was how to do it. You know, it was easy to say thank you and come out of the house. But then I had to face uh, for sponsoring my engineering education myself. So I started thinking, what could I do to support my engineering? And finally thought I could teach maths and science. And therefore, I uh, decided to go to Ladakh from 
the NIT in Kashmir uh, to teach students in a coaching center that I created so that uh, my, my first ambition was to support my own education. Yeah? It was nothing grand, just to support the expenses of my uh, engineering, I started a coaching center. It was a kind of startup, you would say. I took on lease a whole building, employed some stenographers and people. While I had no money in my pocket, I took the risk and started a system where I would teach. And I would teach uh, <clears throat> math, science, and all these subjects at 10th grade level. Very soon, it became so popular that uh, hundreds of students started pouring in and I had to manage with the large numbers. So I devised new interesting ways of teaching in which uh, those who were strong in a subject would teach the weaker ones after my class. And I saw some very interesting developments. The weaker ones definitely got help, but the stronger ones became stars. Yeah, it was particularly good for those who were teaching. That's how I learned that you don't learn anything until you teach someone. For you to uh, really learn something or master it, you should have taught somebody. When you give someone what you know, actually you end up gaining more than the person you give. That's the beauty of giving knowledge, giving or sharing knowledge. It grows in both the recipient and the donor. So that was one beautiful thing, but that was not all. My startup became so successful that in two months, I had earned not only enough for just that year, but for all three years of engineering that was remaining. But this experience of getting so much money in just two months to pay for three years of engineering changed my life forever. First change was that uh, uh, I saw that money can be made anytime. In just two months, you can make enough for three years. So you can always come back to making money. You don't have to lose your sleep and uh, lose your youth for just that. So I sometimes say I got demonetized way before the country did Yeah, in those days. I lost this craze for money that often engineers have. Uh, and the second, second big change, you t uh, second big uh, life-changing experience was that I realized that in life, it's not just about what you need, but also, you know, what others need and what you can do for others. What so, needs you? So the big realization that I had was that uh, life is not just about what I need, but also about what needs me. Mm -hmm. And for me, what needs me were these students that I was teaching. Because I saw that uh, in those days in Ladakh, children were failing en masse. In 10th grade exams, for example, 95% of the students were failing. Only 5% would pass. That was the condition of education in Ladakh of those, those days. So this moved me so much that I thought, I mean, if I become an engineer, I would add to the, to the long queue of engineers wanting jobs. Right. If I do something about these failing students, I may unleash and liberate so many bright minds who are shackled by this system, this education so, system. So that prompted so, you to set up your school in 98 for these students. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I decided that uh, engineering I will do uh, later, but more than that, these students need me because they were caught in this trap of this system. And therefore, soon after I did my, finished my engineering, I started 
bringing reforms in the education system which caused all that failure you know mm. just teaching them before the exams were not an answer as long as the system was producing broken mm. products we cannot uh, solve it by just uh, you know bandage solution or repairing them we must eliminate the source of the problem and that's when i decided um, you know jobs money etc can happen later but these students need me most and believe me this decision was the best decision ever i didn't make much money at that time but i got complete satisfaction about helping so many young bright deserving children who were caught by a very irrelevant inappropriate system and uh, i've always felt very happy but the but the duty of uh, destiny is that the same things that i did with no income no monetary benefit made me so different from everybody else that today i happen to earn more than anybody just because i chose the path of uh, uh, service and you know giving rather than taking like some people say if you if you chase excellence and if you chase um, generosity then mm. money and material come running after you right so yeah perfect i think that's how your uh, you know uh, journey as a giver started and changed many lives and you worked on the skill development of these students rather than putting them into the conventional system of education uh, but also on the other side you know there is a view uh, of you know economists they state that you know they started to model philanthropy as a market uh, would you like to comment on that um yes there are but uh, i don't think uh, that's the kind of giving that uh, our young people should look at you know casting everything in these boxes of uh, uh, mm. economic uh, activities it mm. should be a heartfelt passion that you have and today yeah. i say that once you have earned enough for your personal needs your parents and your dependents there should be a time when you start giving the time right. can come at any time it should not be from an organized sector of giving uh, in the name of you know sort of uh, organized philanthropy but the biggest giving is the giving of your own time and your own self for the cause of others and that gives you a lot of satisfaction Perfect. so yeah. i i believe that everyone at some point on life should stop amassing more and more wealth and start living simply oneself because we don't need too much to stay happy in these lockdowns we learned how little it takes to be happy and That's that right. whatever it takes is not material like uh, products and gadgets it's more how you stay close with your your own people your children your relatives your cousins that's what gives you a lot of happiness also so living simply and helping with the material um, you know blessing you have helping others who may not have as much so uh, what i say is that once you have enough to help yourself and your near and dear ones you should start giving others you should not keep on amassing keep on amassing uh, like in a hindi doha i really love uh, poetry in hindi and urdu so i'm reminded sai itna dijiye jame kutum samaye main bhi bhooka na rahu sadhu na bhooke jaye yeah that much is enough to keep me and my near dear ones uh, well fed and happy and then i start helping others who yeah. uh, need my help because That's otherwise yeah otherwise we end up in this never ending chase you know you will have a house you need two houses 
you will have a car, you need a second car, a bigger car, an even bigger car. And like an Urdu uh, Shairi says, हजारों ख्वाहिशें ऐसी कि हर ख्वाहिश पे दम निकले बहुत निकले मेरे अरमा मगर फिर भी ये कम निकले देर इज नो एंड टू डिजायर डिजायर कीप क्रॉपिंग एज यू फुलफिल डिजायर दैट्स ए मैड रेस दैट यू मे बी लॉस्ट इन सो दे फोर इट इज अ वंडरफुल एक्सपीरियंस टू स्टार्ट गिविंग at some point in life when you have satisfied your own and your family's need now that time can come at any time in my case it came at 21 when i finished my engineering in your case it may come at 35 55 60 when you retire it's up to you to say enough enough there must be an enough of material chase is what i feel because there is no end to material desires there is just no end it's like chasing shadows you know you right. never right. can catch a shadow or like someone said enough is always a little more than what you have so right. that that enough you never catch because it is always a little more than what you have and therefore But, i feel yeah. giving yeah. is a great personal satisfaction also and when one learns to live simply and start giving that's when you really feel rich and that makes me feel that we really did, do not need to worry as young people who are watching this i would say you don't have to worry too much about what my career uh, will take a course jobs i get or not you really don't need a lot you can live happily in a fraction of what people are chasing so whether you get or not you don't need as as long as you are able to minimize your desire if right. you have unlimited desire then right. even the biggest job in the world will leave you desiring more you will you may become the richest man yeah. and yeah. you will always be worried about losing yeah. that or making it double and so on it never ends so best you have to, to know pause. where yeah. where to stop you yeah, need to have a pause and need to learn how to stop and i think you were lucky enough to uh, become a real philanthropist at the age of 21 and started your school and then uh, you know changed many lives so my next question is that i'm just reading this question that world is facing the wrath of nature and uh, due to the, uh, you know to the damage humans have caused to this planet with climate change new diseases and you know extreme weather events and so on you set up the ice stupas uh, in ladakh and uh, you know sort of a great example of sustainable development what should the young students and the youth of the country learn from these successful initiatives of yours well what i see this as is as an application of what you learn in schools and colleges unfortunately our schools and colleges make us do a lot of things in homework in assignments in examination preparations but it has become a kind of ritual which we have to go through whether it is useful anywhere or not it's as if some system needed us to do whereas the value of education really is in how much you can apply it to make life better to make people happier so my innovations were nothing more than application of what you find in your middle school and high school science or math so for example i stupas <clears throat> i'm sorry i'm not able to show it here is a way of keeping water from winter into spring time now winter is when there is water in the streams in ladakh mm. but there is no use because there is no farming in winter and spring time is a time when everybody all farmers need water for every drop there are conflicts but there is very little water coming from the glaciers because uh, the glaciers are far 
high too high to melt in early spring uh, so spring is when the farmers have to plant and there is not enough water so i just put up a question this question is uh, from professor anjali from chandigarh she is asking as we know that children are curious by nature but some years down the line this curiosity takes a back seat is it, is our education system in any way responsible for subduing this inquisitiveness in our children so please comment on that this is something related to what you were answering very beautiful question very beautiful question so many people ask me how come you know you did well in school and you have done this you come from a remote tiny village and so on and i say maybe exactly for that reason because i did not have a school in my village and till 9 years of age i didn't go to any schools i could roam around in the village and be my curiosity my inquisitiveness was my software you know mm. that helped me learn so inquisitive curiosity is a beautiful software that nature packs with the hardware the baby at its birth you know and this software must be kept intact we may be able to do anything or not in the name of education but if we break this curiosity we have lost it so any school that may teach something or not as long as it keeps the curiosity alive is a great school similarly in families we do a lot to kill that curiosity uh, more than helping we hurt a child when we keep snubbing them uh, don't ask this don't do this you can't do this what kind of question is this that really kills the the very uh, you know inbuilt software that children have i feel agreeing to her i feel that you may take away all my schools and teachers and textbooks but if you just live my leave my curiosity with me i'll do fine mm. and the problem is that half our curiosity this software is killed by the parents and then the remaining half you go into the school and the teachers start uh, breaking it first of all they'll teach you in a new medium of instruction if you speak punjabi they'll start in english if i spoke ladakhi they'll suddenly say all that i learnt in ladakhi are useless you have to mm. start in hindi or urdu and after 8 years of struggling with hindi or urdu i am told this also is useless now you start with english so all these things break the confidence of the child and therefore his curiosity because a child is curious by nature you don't have to do much it comes packed with the hardware right i really feel teachers don't have to teach much as long as the child has curiosity they have they are in discovery mode they'll find it out from anywhere and you can be a facilitator but if you kill that and then you you know do it manually after destroying the, its automatic system of learning in this uh, baby then you start manual yeah. feeding of it you yeah. fail you fail so yes definitely our schools are destroying our children's curiosity we must have a surrounding with teachers and parents and everybody that encourages people to question however stupid the question may sound we should encourage we should appreciate and then very soon they start making sense and they start uh, you know learning to learn so very true curiosity must be kept no, alive I, i think a very very well elaborated and you know very well said sir and uh, now the questions are coming on education so the next question is that making a nation self reliant not only involves industrial reforms but the level and type of education also plays an important role in it in india we don't see anything like that every student goes through a preset template based learning process largely i won't say in, in india we don't see it at all but largely uh, where, where skill evaluation can't be made which ultimately results in a huge job crisis 
uh, like you know the recent incident of corona labor migration can also be mentioned and not to elaborate on that but what is your take on this and what are some key changes that our education system must go through in order to eradicate these issues a brief answer would help yeah so mm -hmm. uh, so when we are in a system that is not of our own design for our own needs when it is a ready made prescription from some other culture or era then we lose the relation between the ritual we do in school and uh, the reality outside so then it becomes really a ritual so i think any education system must address real needs of the times if our country is uh, and the planet is facing grave dangers from uh, industrial production then mm. we should change what we put into our children we should start talking about healing the planet rather than further fueling its destruction so similarly whatever is the need of the time must be uh, placed in our system and it should become an answer for whether it is uh, diseases in rural areas or solving farmers problems it has to be rooted in uh, questions and issues in real life and therefore an educational reform to meet the needs of life and industrial reform to meet what are culture and civilization uh, demands rather than just copying something from the west yeah so wow. we have to really make things relevant for example i see when i come to delhi buildings that are all glass yeah all glass this may be good in london which is sub zero new york but in 45 degree delhi we just copy that and call it industrial development and make the 45 degree even higher and then we solve that with air conditioners at double the power right. why don't we learn that we are in india we right. can simplify this by uh, uh, adapting development to our needs and similarly adapting education to those needs and provide solutions that we need in our country i think that's a beautiful example you gave uh, on the infrastructure which relates to other uh, you know uh, growing uh, opportunities um, mm -hmm. you know and i i think our viewers have a great takeaway here that especially the education system to you know develop uh, solutions on the basis of the exact needs which have very high relevance so thank you very much on that this is a question coming from professor arti joshi from panchkula haryana uh, she is asking what inspired students educational and cultural movement of ladakh sekmor uh, how far do you think your destination is uh, cured how how far is you think is your destination is like where you see sekmor going and what exactly you want to achieve okay. and when so i feel that uh, it's not always only an inspiration some cases yes inspiration but in my case and in many of your cases also it is empathy it is often empathy about what is happening yeah? so when i came back from after my engineering i saw children failing and mass like i said i was in a bubble i didn't know but then i saw outside uh, thanks to this accident where, which compelled me to teach to finance my engineering mm. i saw that 95% of the children fail and i felt that when 95% of the students fail then it is the system failing so many young bright people made to feel useless that's like a house on fire it's like your house is on fire mm. so then i say when you see your house is on fire it's not inspiration that you are waiting for you have to do whatever it takes yeah so if you feel the pain of those people around you then it's empathy that makes you do whatever it takes throw water on the burning house or in this case 
uh, work on educational reform. So it was that empathy that compelled me to work in education and not join the long queues for engineering jobs, as I said in the beginning. Thank you. Perfect. I think that gives a quite perspective and makes it very clear uh, why you set up SecMol, which is an example and again a, a great inspiring initiative. Uh, the next question is uh, that having been, you mentioned a few, few, few times that having been bullied and misunderstood during your own school days, you know, what message would you give to the young students and youth regarding the same? How to counter and how to be resilient and what is the solution? About bullying? You're saying right. yeah you mentioned was that you know you were misunderstood and you know so how do uh -huh. you it's yeah yeah yeah, that. yeah yeah mm. um well in my case uh, initial phase it made me feel very small uh, very helpless but uh, somehow i kept my own inspiration alive and then realized that uh, it was not physical bullying so much in my case. It was more like I was treated as a retarded person, you know, coming from the mountains of Ladakh who didn't speak Hindi or English uh, and had not gone to any schools. I was treated like a mentally challenged person. Um, uh, yet, uh, children are very good at learning. So I started catching up. And there was a point when I thought that I have missed some years. And these other children have had those, uh, you know, uh, what do you call a uh, kind of uh, head start. Yeah. They have had a head start. So the inspiration that I got and that helped me a lot was not to give up because I'm so far behind but to double my efforts. So actually, right. I started thinking these people can afford to play and sleep uh, long hours. I have to catch up with them. If I do the same thing as they do, I'll always be at the same distance behind mm -hmm. them. So I'll have to study double the hours that they study. I'll have to work twice as hard as they do if I have to close the gap. Yeah, the gap between them and me. So I started working so hard. I used to uh, wake up through the whole night. You know, I had a very funny schedule. I would sleep, go to sleep at around seven and get up at around one or two. And then from one or two till the rest of the day, I would keep awake and up and study hard. And that was a beautiful way. I grew up in hostels. So that time of night was also very interesting because all the students in my hostel would go to sleep and would have all their books left for me on their desks. So I didn't have money to buy all kinds of books, books but when they all would go to sleep, I would, have, I would become the master of all the books in the hostel. So it kind of helped me to have everything for me. And it also saved me from you know the gossip and wasting time in the evenings generally in the evenings is when you waste a lot of time by getting up very early i would save myself from the wasteful uh, gossip and backbites that go on in the evenings and in the solitude and peace of early mornings i would work hard twice as much as others and very soon I was able to catch up with uh, the rest of the students. So I think it is this uh, inspiration that you need to get that I better not give up. I double my efforts to catch up with the rest of the people. I think uh, that was something beautiful you did. And that was a commitment you made to yourself and put it into practice and through your discipline. Um, uh, hearty, uh, you know, I really acknowledge that and I think many others would be doing that also and having a good uh, takeaway from your answer. The next uh, one is a little bit, uh, I would like to, you know, share more and ask more also, uh, rather ask you more about innovation and startups before we move on to your recent campaigns, which you have just launched in your last two videos and all. Um, what do you think is the Indian innovation ecosystem missing? 
This is one. Mm. The second is, what do you think is beautiful about Indian innovation ecosystem? So there are two questions. So first we talk about what's missing and what is the solution. Mm. So what is missing, I think, uh, in the whole system from innovation to education is originality of thoughts. We are from childhood made to think like somebody else, like those in New Delhi. And if you go to New Delhi, we'll be told you have to think like those in London. <laughs> and then London says New York. So we are made to think like somebody. We are not help to think on our own feet and in innovation original thinking is the very crux you know as long as you don't have original thinking you can't really find true solutions you can't even find problems leave aside solutions when you are you are uh, on borrowed thinking you will solve some problems that others solve i'll give you an example i go to this iits and every time i come back depressed i would say to these yeah. tech fests you know tech fest i thought um, i would like to see and i was invited and i would see young bright people making robots fight <laughs> and uh, racing drones now that's something that western youngsters in America and England may be able to afford because they have solved their sanitation and water problems maybe 100 years ago. So they have nothing but to make robots fight or race drones. In India, we have so many real life problems. How can you help a woman in a village keep her milk for five days instead of you know it going spoiled in 24 hours? so many interesting challenges how to uh, restore greenery in a deserted valley but we live on yeah. borrowed mind and therefore we imitate other people's problems even they have a problem with not knowing what to do with technology and we yeah. borrow yeah. that rather than solving our own challenges so original thinking is the missing thing now, what is so good about Indian innovation scenario is the opposite of it. The mm. whole, you have an empty ground. There's so little that has happened. Right. Because our conditions are so unique. You have no competition from Harvard or Oxford. The whole <laughs> field is yours to prove. For example, for me in Ladakh. Nobody has worked on ice and water systems for cold regions or how to keep buildings warm with solar energy. So the advantage in my case here is that the whole playing field is empty for me to intervene. Same in most parts of India, people have solved everything in the West, but Indian problems are all there inviting you to come and uh, change the world. So you have every opportunity. No, I think that's a great, uh, again, you know, a wonderful answer. And being a strong advocate of originality, uh, could you share with our audience that what two success stories of innovation have really moved you and, and you know, have impressed you from our country? Any two or okay. three. Okay. Mm. So, for example, this uh, person from Gujarat who started Mitti Kool, yeah, Mitti Kool is a concept. He's, he's the son of a Kumhar, a pot maker. And he took it from the con traditional pot making to another level. He started using evaporative cooling, which is like an eighth class science, by making his pots two layered, two layered with water inside. And the water uh, evaporates on the surface of the clay pot. And that makes it cool down by around 10 degrees compared to the outside. And mm. inside the hollow or the box, you can put your food, you can put your vegetables, your milk, and it lasts several more days to a week almost with no electricity, with nothing, no power, no moving parts, no electricity. This is beautiful. I think... 
this helps people in villages more than a phd with his long thesis and <laughs> titles behind the name right any any other thing come any any other innovation come to your mind any other innovation this is a great yeah example. i've seen others like bicycle pedal power being used to do various things someone had uh, bumpy bumpy roads in the village but that bumpiness normally hurts us at best right. at best we put some springs to make it softer but that right. also only absorbs the shock but doesn't take advantage of the problem so this right. person connected the seat of the bicycle to the gears of the wheel so that every time the seat with the weight of the rider pushes down it pushes the bicycle like a extra pedal so every time on the bumpy road you bump it makes it go further in the direction you want to go not just suffering the problem not even solving but actually taking advantage of the problem that's brilliant. what you should do in life brilliant example sir brilliant example i think yes. that's real original thinking yeah beautiful beautiful i think sir i'll take a questions coming from uh, the audience here um, uh, mr nitin is asking uh, that uh, can you envision one change covid uh, can bring to engineering education in india <laughs> this may not uh... please our engineer friends but uh, i think we are over engineering our world <laughs> we have made our lives so complicated with so much engineering that that people get into depression people want to quit and all that this covid and its uh, lockdown taught us how less of all this engineering is actually needed to keep us happy so i think the best engineering is not only of the outside world of the material world i find the best engineer was maybe buddha listen to this what buddha said you know we engineers normally say uh, success success is owning this and owning that and you know fulfilling so many desires that we may have professionally or uh, financially buddha said for a human being the greatest achievement is uh, not to fulfill a thousand desires but to eliminate a single desire so if you are able to eliminate desires that's when you are rich otherwise you have desires and desires and desires and you may keep fulfilling 1000 but then this 1001 will raise its head it will never end so therefore engineering of the inside which is what yoga which is what vedas which is what vipassana teaches you the engineering of the world within so i think that we engineers need to learn from this experience that mm. it doesn't actually need so much material uh, goods to keep us happy actually we have overdone that we have overdone that to an extent that we can't even handle our houses and then we have done so much damage by overdoing this that other beings in the world like birds and bees and plants can't even live so why not go slower i am actually happy when i hear gdp is going down i am yeah. actually happier i think I... we we were addicted to hyper uh, fast development we can do with much less we need to you know mm, withdraw come out of this addiction to material uh, happiness i think so uh, you are a great example of uh, you you know uh, using resources how well one can use resources i think i salute you for that and i think the comments coming here are you know one person michelle uh, is mentioning about you know the great example of buddha you gave and his quote you know and uh, there, there are other uh, questions on the way uh, there is one question from kamal jeet singh chopra from opportunity to plentiful opportunity 
great example of uh, to create uh, blue ocean zone in Ladakh. You know, so there, there are a lot of great comments coming up. Uh, I'll move on to the campaign now. You know, you you started the boycott China uh, products campaign, and uh, and in your couple of videos which are coming every week, and we I personally heard uh, most of them. And uh, now here, you know, when you mentioned about the software boycott, and you mentioned about a hardware boycott, and software is easy to you know uninstall, whereas you know you mentioned that to take a year to have a hardware boycott. What exactly are you hinting, hinting at? Uh, can we have a very different answer, unlikely what you mentioned on the television in the last few days? What exactly are you hinting at? You know, uh, what, what area you want to, what sector of society you want to energize and, and mm. tempt, you know, for good? So normally uh, such calls for boycotts and so on last a day or two and it's all gone. You know, it comes as a flood, a outburst of emotions, mm. uh, and you see people throwing down their televisions and burning their gadgets, and then they forget. Only thing changes that you are left with no television, <laughs> and mm. that's all uh, you achieve. So that's not an answer. That's why I wanted to say that be strategic. Don't be rash and reactive. Be active, not reactive. So you take time on your side. You mm. don't have to haste. Don't have to think that you do it today or you don't do it at all. You boycott made in China or made anywhere with, uh, you know, where human rights are not respected, where environmental protection is not respected, where uh, systems are violated like subsidies and currency manipulation so all such things you should boycott that's a very good thing but not in an emo emotional outburst you have to do it like a middle path not a flood not a trickle but a middle path that sustains so take a year and phase out so that you give time to industry to adapt to the changing needs and choices of consumers. This way, you'll give time to the industry to bring their factories out of China, establish it in India or other countries. Otherwise, uh, it becomes like uh, 36 hours of mayhem and then nothing later. So it has to be sustained is what I meant. Right. And to be given its time to have this exactly. you know, uh, commission. But, uh, but I also add, add to that an environmental touch. Like I was saying, we don't need so many cheap goods. We can live much simpler with two pairs of shoes or three pairs of shoes. We don't need to buy 30 pairs of cheap Chinese shoes. Yeah? So mm. we should reduce our needs is also a message that I want to give. If you have enough, then start helping others. The art of giving, the economics of giving. Now, my friends from engineering and economics may not understand my, you know, touchy-feely uh, philosophies. I'll speak in their language. There's a theory in economics called the law of diminishing returns or law of diminishing utilities. It says that when you get your first pair of shoes, first pair of shoes, you have amazing satisfaction that you get. When you get your second pair of shoes, you're happy, but nothing so special. Third right. pair of shoes, okay. By the 10th pair of shoes, you don't even know you have one. I agree. The yeah. 11th pair of shoes, which hmm. hardly gives you any satisfaction, if you suddenly decide to give it to a person who has no shoes, it will give that person the same satisfaction as your first pair could give you. So Brilliant, like why that. not start giving others who it will give so much more satisfaction so that the absolute satisfaction collective from your 11 pair of shoes given to 11 needy people after keeping two or three that you really need will have so much more absolute good that you could do to others. That's the art and economics of giving. Brilliant, sir. I think that that is so answered from the art. 
And you know, I think we need we as humans need to integrate <laughs> our demands and desires to keep a fine balance of demand and supply. And you and have what we actually need, acquire what we actually need. Right. So I'll take on to the next question, sir. From I'll, I'll just add here. I'll just add here to my friends who might be, you know, little concerned, worried, nervous uh, in the COVID situation. What happens to money? What happens to salaries, jobs? You really don't need too much. You will be happier with less and be happy that this has happened. You, it might connect it you to yourself, you to your near and dear ones. So it's a great blessing in disguise. Very well said, sir. Thank you again to add that mm -hmm. comment uh, to motivate and encourage their, uh, you know, their, 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 them to, you know, have the spirits high. You know, very important, you know. Uh, so the next question coming up is from Mr. Ankit from Faridabad. He's an entrepreneur. He says that after you shared your thoughts right. on boycott, he says after you shared your thoughts on boycotting Chinese goods. I'm just reading it. We Indians are quite motivated to take uh, steps in this direction. But the only constraint is that the Indian alternatives are little match to the variety and prices of the goods we get from China and other countries. What steps to, uh, do we need to take at different levels to cover this gap? Yes, yes, yes. So on the consumer side, we need to have a little patience and restraint. Mm. Uh, because we should see that we were taken over by these cheap goods, you know. Uh, it was like an addiction. So when you want to get rid of addiction, you yes. have to go through some treatment. You may have some withdrawal uh, pains, yeah, okay. short term. So mm. any treatment has some inconveniences and pains, but the life after that is happy and healthy. So for that uh, bigger picture, you go through some inconvenience in the beginning. And same with this boycott, you may have some problem replacing things and finding alternatives or paying a little more. But very soon you will have given birth to a whole new ecosystem of uh, business and products that are free from these uh, uh, exploitations and violations yeah, mm -hmm. of human and environment. Now, on the <clears throat> producer side is the bigger responsibility. As I was saying, this is a golden opportunity on a platter. Our, uh, our entrepreneurs, our startups really need to take it as a great opportunity and uh, rise to the occasion and become effective, competitive uh, solution providers and use this as the best launching pad with all the patronage that India is giving and the world will give because they also don't want to get it from China. So, so many companies are trying to come out of China and look at India. We have to give that environment that this becomes a launching pad for a new India. Right. So, we should right. not take it complacently that these consumers have nowhere to go. They don't buy Chinese. They'll have to buy my whatever I produce. We'll have right. to really make the most of this opportunity. <clears throat> uh, sir, connecting to that question, I would like to ask you that, you know, when you mentioned about addiction, obviously we get addicted and it takes a while to come out of it, of any, any habit. You know, maybe it's a habit of buying here, which is relevant to our conversation at the moment. Uh, you know, what do you think the government and the environment needs to do? Because to come up to those, uh, you know, prices which we have adjusted ourselves and it suits our pocket, what sort of uh, two, three ideas you would like to give so that we are able to offer the same kind or a little, you know, similar kind of price and also the good quality and the variety? You know, what do you think I the role would be? Yeah, government has to do a lot, I feel. Um, in China, government is like a partner in all businesses. You know, they see themselves as a partner. I was in Nepal uh, 10 years ago. There were curfews in the city because of some political problem and contractors could not finish their projects. And the Chinese embassy in Nepal were using their blue plate cars to help contractors move cement and 
you know the gravel and things so that they could finish their pro pro projects because blue plate cars of the embassy have free pass they cannot be stopped so the government was so proactive that they would help the entrepreneurs with their embassy diplomatic co core cars to help finish those projects okay. which i don't see in our country there is very little support from the government and many times they become the problem you know there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, colonial hangover where the entrepreneur or the businessman is treated like a criminal you have to prove that you're good uh, to be even taken seriously so mm -hmm. when our government charges 30% as tax that tax should be seen like a share in the business you know if you make the business grow your share will be bigger that's the kind of uh, vision the government should have that you help every business grow bigger so that your share of tax also grows so much bigger and we should do away with all the red tapism and uh, some kind of uh, vicarious pleasure that officers get in scuttling things and getting the uh, entrepreneur come and you know um, plead for mercy mm -hmm. and so on we can't match other nations if we are stuck in a system like this we have said goodbye to colonial times 70 years ago it should be all about enabling and mm. empowering and facilitating government not yeah. a scuttling government that colonial governments were absolutely uh, thank you very much for that answer and that uh, you know i would say a point for, from where you know one can look at hope and have better support from the administration uh this question next one is coming from miss sango from mcclord ganj uh she is asking uh somewhere a little bit similar but uh, you know she is framed her in her own way uh she is asking i have been a tibetan i uh, you know support boycott china products but in india there are 275 million uh, poor people with 48 million uh, you know people unemployed and people and people are addicted to chinese goods i think you already answered but she has her own perspective and i think i should take up her question with you uh, you know like chinese goods like cups kettles diwali lights and uh, and and other things are there to earn livelihood how will the small shop owners you know and small vendors survive and what is the alternative for such small vendors and shops when they have to look at ingenious products and make you know uh, things in their own vicinity and all and manufacture how how can they you know yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i hope you got the question yeah yeah as i said earlier also it's all relative so it may relatively feel feel convenient and uh, good business to mm. deal with chinas you may mm. think of it as employment but we should also not forget the number of jobs that it's taking away sometimes people tell me that it gives employment but i think it takes away 10 times more and right. think of the the tomorrow where so many indian uh, makers could make mm. uh, all those things in india and get employed and get benefited also we must not uh, lose sight of this vast population base that india has of all the countries if one can match china then it should be india because of it exactly the same population base that requires all these goods so we should be able to really make things very cheaply without violating all those things that i said but even with the scale of economics we should be able to and that's what we should uh, excel at uh, and not look at just the the income of the person in trading with it trading chinese goods that's hardly an employment what really is employment is making of it and trading of it both within the country i think right. we can match it uh, provided we have support from the government with infrastructure with a very enabling facilitative uh, attitude of the government all these will go to doubly benefit the poor people because 
they they can do the trade as well as the making of it mm. no i think that absolutely uh, you know uh, this also your campaign which is gaining massive popularity i think this also would also increase more employment you know and reduce unemployment because as you mentioned you know more labor coming in more skilled force coming in in factories new factories popping up which is i think the way forward you know we need this is a multiple i would say beneficial uh, you know campaign for multiple benefits which you have just started there's a question coming from mr pradeep singh man uh, he is not mentioned the location but he is saying that uh, sonam sir why no indian companies making their known brands are no known brands on laptops and mobiles uh, where when uh, the demand of laptops and mobiles in india is highest in the world so why there are no popular brands uh, making in india from india making laptops and mobiles i saw several such brands entering the market but uh, losing in the competition like hcl had some i that i remember um mm. again i think uh, partly there is some problem with our education which does not develop uh, innovation and original thinking as i said uh, th- that's perhaps why we also produce so many it professionals but there's hardly anyone who launches an indian product that becomes global it's not only with hardware it's also with software which doesn't take uh, skilled labor it's all that our it uh, world is known for we are one of the biggest it world uh, it countries but we are not doing anything original so it kind of hints that it's not to do with factories and <clears throat> workers there it's to do with our um, uh, young educated entrepreneurs not being able to uh, think of original businesses the best of indian professionals go and work for google work they run google they run microsoft they run amazon but they don't launch right. indian brands i think more than in the more than in the um, the the physical space there's something we need to do in the intellectual space in our schools universities some kind of uh, enabling and empowering of these young people to do original work right. and not just train them to copy copy and work for others we are right. becoming babus for multinational i think uh, you, you are again uh, you know pressing on the originality of ideas coming in education also and uh, while uh, originality of ideas coming on ground from innovators also and I, it starts from but, education but, please you please you can imagine why you can imagine why when we all are put through a school system where in 10th grade and 12th grade you are expected to copy the right answer from the book yeah right. the right answer is what is in the book the right answer is not what you think right with your own thinking that doesn't right. get marks you right. get marks for saying what the book says and then as these people grow f- further they become uh, people who don't give solutions their own solutions they give borrowed solutions from other people other companies mm. right i think i'll uh, definitely you know come on to that question also before another 10 minutes with you hopefully uh, we will uh, come on to uh, question Thanks. related to the downside and scope of online education but before that i just want to uh, wanted to have your view like lot of indian startups you know the big ones you know uh, you know big ones not to name Uh, each one of them but most of them uh, are having huge investments from chinese uh, investors right and your suggestion on boycotting and all your campaign how does it fit for them how do they uh, you know adapt to this sort of a message and change or how should they go ahead with it what exact what are your thoughts uh, viewers and i personally also like to know about it. so again again it's it's about consumer awareness citizens action so take give them time is what my answer is for for those businesses startups with chinese investment for example give them 3 years if you are saying 
uh, hardware in a year, mixed products in two years, investment uh, businesses three years. They have time to change or people in India will start questioning in three years that if it has investment from unfriendly countries, we won't buy. For now, for now, we should not react. We should act and let them be and give them the time to change. And if they don't change, obviously there'll be an alternative without that kind of investment, which people will patronize. So for every Paytm or Zomato or Make My Trip, there'll be others who will make their pitch line as we are clean. We don't depend on, uh, you know, uh, trap, investment traps. So people will patronize that and these businesses will either have to adapt and swim or sink. That's how I think it will unfold if people continued this spirit uh, sustainably for long enough. So do you think this is only patriotism and uh, but also is it smart economics? Um, smart economics for the nation, yes, because if you see the future, you, you see that India has a trade deficit of some 60 billion, which was 10 years ago, maybe only 20 billion. And if you project for future, it will be more and more and more, which means we'll be falling in a trap. It's a bait for a trap. And uh, you would be foolish if you see the future and still do the same thing. So it is economics, but it is also ethics. As I said, it is also ethics. Just like you don't buy products that are uh, made with child labor. Yeah, we have seen people stop buying things to do with child labor. You have seen that people use their wallets to discourage uh, cruelty to animals. You know, even cinemas, films these days say that in this film, the shooting of this film, no animals were harmed. Why? Because there are enough people who will not sponsor such films that don't say that. So also, I would say it's a matter of ethics for us to say that we care about animals, we care of children, and you don't care about human beings, the human rights of 1.4 billion people, uh, of the Tibetan minorities, of the Uyghur minorities. So it's also ethics that should guide us not to sponsor as something that does a lot of harm to a lot of people, not only economics and price tags, but also what is right. Right. So ethics uh, play a key role as well. You know, it's not just about uh, the rules of the game or just a system, but ethics also. My next question. Where are you otherwise, made? otherwise, why won't we buy cheap, cheap goods made with child labor? Why would anybody stop that? But we stopped. It was cheaper, yet we stopped. Hmm. Right, <clears throat> right. Well, so my next question, sir, is when you mentioned in your video recently about uh, wallet war. So could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, it is uh, about economics. In China's case, this time it was mainly a political problem inside China than a border problem here. The border problem was to just distract the people within China who were frustrated with the government. So in such a case, military response doesn't help. In such a case, the wallet response helps more because it does the damage that they fear. And therefore, the wallet war, it's a cleverer way of uh, and more peaceful. What could be more nonviolent and peaceful then citizens using their wallets to say that we won't sponsor your behavior. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang Chuk. Uh, thank you very much. Wish you good luck and uh, you're doing great. Keep doing great, sir. Thank you very much. We uh, great, great support from your ideas we had and great learning. Thank you very much. Thanks from Chitkari. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And that's Ladakh. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you.